course, so stay tuned for a secret message following this episode. Dawn of Dragons, Season 3, Episode 2, Phoenix Rising. The late morning sun baked into the back of my plated shoulders as we walked through the busy marketplace. A familiar smell hit my nose, bringing back memories from a little over a month ago. Was it really only a month? Time had seemed to truly move lately as if suspended in a sweet baker's syrup. Oh, <laughs> Scott Mir, you smell that, my friend. <laughs> Those pies. Yes. Come, friends, let's treat ourselves. Scott Mir and I had these during the games, and they are delicious. Not as delicious as my victory that day. <laughs> that, that's mm. not how I remember it. Hmm. Not how any of us remember it, for that matter. You weren't even there. Huh. Where's your owl, by the way? Happily soaring in the skies far from you. Don't we all wish we were there? Wow. Well, uh, lunch sounds great to me as well. <laughs> yes. And a tall glass of milk, I'm sure. <laughs> Very tall. <laughs> Everyone was in great spirits that day. The journey into town was only a couple hours from our camp by the side of the northern merchant road we had followed from Bemel to Ellington. The jewel of the new world known as Ellington is a bustling metropolis of trade and the arts. Who is that? Cordelia pointed to a statue of a man dressed regally with a quill in one hand and a scroll in the other. The hand holding the quill was resting on his chin, in thought. The faint, close-cropped beard outlined his jaw, his eyes looking back towards the market, as if willing it to spring up before him. Surprisingly, no name was found. Just a quote. Hmm. Trade is meant to serve the people, not the other way around. Ah, yes. Angelos of Basilicus. The first Duke of Ellington. Or of the New World, for all we know. It is a very rare title. But he led the rebellion. Rebellion is a pretty strong word, I think. More like they just left, really. Different ideologies. Vic stared up at the statue, towering 20 feet high from its 10-foot pedestal. A slight smile cracked the corner of his mouth. Hmm. hmm. The predecessor to Vlasis Andreas. The current Duke of Ellington. The Duke of Ellington, being known as a fair and just man, had built a community in the last 20 years that had healed the wounds of the Civil War 50 years ago that separated the land of Bells from the trade baronies of Darkovnia and made a city that was a legend in its own time. Angelos led the people of Bells and was elected to a rank of Duke. Now, Dukes were unheard of in the land of the trade barons. The people offered this title collectively with Angelos to help impose responsibility rather than establish power. A responsibility to care for the people in their care. A responsibility both Angelos and Vlasis took very serious. We made our way to the familiar red and cream striped cart, the same sign of Miloslava's meat pies, weathered from the elements, stood as tall as the halfling behind it slightly leaning to the right corner, facing the crowd bustling by. Greetings! Why, don't you know cafe today? Please, step right up! The vendor smiled genuinely, 
as she slowly turns some of the flaky wares over on the hot iron table used for browning them. The smell of sweet onions sautéed in sherry, blending with beef, was prominent. This danced as it mixed with the scent of that buttery pastry, gently frying on one side. I could sense Scottmere vibrating with happy excitement, as was I. Thank you. May I have a- Beef and onion. But- Nothing but the best for my good friend here. The beef and onion you won't regret. Oh. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I guess I'll have the- Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Look, Cordelia, there's a chicken and parsnip one. Oh, I do love parsnips. Hmm. Cordelia put her hand on her chin and thought for a moment, both honestly sounding equally delicious. Hmm. Okay, I'll take that. There's dessert pastries, too. Hmm. At this time of day. Yeah, I'm more leaning toward the venison there. But Cordelia, you'd probably like that one, too. Ah! Uh... Oh, boy. The vendor seemed utterly confused, trying to keep up with the deluge of inquiries, pouring at them all at once. I'll be honest, pardon me pitied her. Cordelia was trying to wrest control of the conversation, and I could see her emerald eyes darken slightly as they narrowed. So I'll- Hold up, all of you! She can make her own decision and doesn't need Would you all shut up! Everyone was frozen, wide-eyed and awestruck. Looking at was once a young woman now clenching her hands in bold fists, her chest slightly heaving in frustration. Hey, I get pretty angry too. She shot him a look that would have burned a hole through any other warrior. Scottmere simply shrugged and turned back to Miroslava. I'll grab a beef and onion and whatever my friend here wants. My treat. We all made our purchases for a light lunch and continued across the street towards the grassy park that held the games that we had participated in. The grandstands were actually permanent structures, as were many of the platforms and stages. Look at that! What an arena! The games are quite the production. (laughs) Yeah, they sure are. Zoran took a moment to look around beaming with a bit of pride. He was here before and marked a rogue champion by Elias Silvertongue, the king of bards himself. We could see the Duke's Keep on the other side of the stadium area, about a hundred yards from the last stages. Formerly a fortress with a high wall to protect the citizens in case of invasion, now the keep was simply the central tower overlooking the city from over 300 feet up. After being in the keep itself, I knew the Baron rarely ascended past halfway. The gray and rose-colored stones from the former wall were repurposed to build the stages in the stadium seating. (laughs) It was a bold move, but part of the plan to fight back on the discourse and the actual need for defensive with simply entertainment. Keep them busy and keep it accessible to all, and there would be no need for further defenses, was the thought. Stop! Someone! Stop that thief! A young girl was running from a baker with a loaf of bread in her hand, right into... Oh! 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 <laughs> oh. oh, there, lassie. Oh, you shouldn't just be stealing. All right, let's just, uh, let's just get you sword. I demand that she be punished! Yeah, he's just scum. But, this her. is an outrage! What what am I supposed to do with a riffraff like her running round? Look at her. Obviously crawled from the trash heap or possibly the sewer. This is an outrage. But I'm so hungry. Please. What is that smell? Is it her hair or her clothing? She's probably got disease. Shameful. Oh, no. Send her away. Away, I think. Well, everyone calm down. There's no need to have anything happen. Nice. At, at least she would have lice. Look at the dirt and absolute uncleanliness. Before we catch a death or whatever it was that she's rolled in lately. 
I say we just take her to the pond and give her a bath. Of course. A bath would be a gift for the poor creature. Yes. Bathe her. Yes, bathe her! Bah. Such scum should be drowned. Drowned in river like the rats. The only way to be sure. Oh, 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 there. No one is going to touch this girl. <laughs> Hear me? Move, or you'll get the same. Yeah. Drown him. Drown them. <laughs> Drown, Drown them all. He's probably infected too, huh? Yeah, filthy. <laughs> all of them. Hold up. Everyone paused for a moment as I walked into the growing mob. <sighs> I'll pay for the bread. Who's the fancy one with the gold armor? There's Holy Gaudy. Heavy too. Huh. We don't need charity from the likes of him. In fact, now it's not for sale. Be gone. I demand that she be punished. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the way, you fool! Yeah, we got you. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we need yeah. to not. I stood my ground, not only because I had no intention of letting this shopkeep or the mob of wild dogs potentially take this child's life. I had seen vigilante justice in other situations, and honestly, the outcome rarely was righteous. I also saw the face of the other man. His head was bald, save a ring. With two thick salt and pepper mutton chops to either side. His blue eyes were wide in recognition. No. We warned you! Yes, God, is it? Show him what we do to the outside. We need them we... now. <laughs> Get him! I said, be gone. Ah. I easily caught the man's hand. My eyebrows raised as I shook my head, looking at the cane clutched in his trembling hand. An arrow split the cane shaft inches above my wrist. His eyes were once wild, were now wide. Elaviv stepped into the now frozen crowd, knocking another arrow into her bow. Behind her, I saw the rest of my friends fanning out to support if needed. The crowd murmured. Wait, is that really that? Can I be a six win? What? This is shocking. Look at that. It can't be. What kind of thing? Wait. You are. <laughs> Gelder Ironfest. I looked at the other man with the sideburns who stood up for the child. He sheathed his sword and stood with one bald fist across his chest. I suddenly remembered him in an archer's dark leather armor, similar to Elevate, with the sword and crown we both wore. You. I know you. Don't I? Lamprey, sir? Six archers. Served with you in the Battle of the Cheerless Swamp. Yes. <laughs> yes, well met, old friend. Um, you are Kelder Ironfist? The, 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 then you must be Elevate Eve Hawklight. From the Six Wings. Wait, is that really that? Oh, no, six from the Six Wow. Oh, Please oh, forgive us, we only... You only meant to take an opportunity to direct your own anger on this hungry child. Who else would steal a loaf of bread if they were not simply hungry? Elaviv nodded in the direction of the girl. She was shaking slightly, her eyes blazed with anger and determination. A familiar sight for me, but from a long time ago. It shouldn't take me a stranger to your city and your culture to protect your own people. The shopkeep nodded and brought his hands up, his face laden with guilt and surrendering to his I, obvious wrongdoing. I concur. This is an embarrassment. I sincerely apologize. Please, please forgive me. I love even the baker looked at each other directly. With a tense exhale, she lowered her bow, and seeing the look of guilt spread across the crowd, nodded before walking to Lamprey, clasping his forearm in a soldier's handshake. The crow's feet in the corner of his eyes cracked with a wide smile. They glistened slightly. <laughs> it's 
It's good to see you again, Captain. A blessing to see you as well, old friend. I noticed the angry mob had largely dissipated into the bustling streets, leaving me with a very embarrassed shopkeep. Hmm. Well, here's two silver for the bread. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. And two silver for you, lassie. Get oh. yourself another later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keldor. Alviv, are you heading to the Duke? Yes, old friend, we are. Well, I have news for him as well. Mind if I join you? Not at all. Come, tell me what's become of the company since I last saw you. That is truly unfortunate. Most unfortunate. The Duke was, from what I could tell, taking the news about the destruction of the artifact as well as could be expected. The familiar dark wood walls of his meeting room were pleasant and rather cozy. The maiden and knight carvings in that fireplace caught the light from the fire within. As night was falling, the chill was becoming more prevalent in the stone halls. I could smell the sweet birch log burning slowly in the hearth. His hands cupped the bowl of the copper goblet in his hand, gently as he searched his mind for options. Hmm. Hmm. Well, no use grieving over that which we don't understand. What was it? What was it called again? The Green Heart Stone. Yes. Yes, Green Heart Stone. Does this mean anything to you, Elias? Nothing. I can only hope our friends in the Ivory Library could tell us more, but I'm not... Uh, it's no matter. The more I think on it, it seems just better off being destroyed than in the hands of Lord Pallas. I wouldn't... I know I wouldn't know how to use such a thing. You... You make an excellent point, Your Grace. Not to mention the return of both Keldor Iron Fist and Elaviv Hawklight is an edge not foreseen as well. Undoubtedly so. Keldor and Elaviv, what do you know of the current state of your order? We looked at each other briefly. Truth be told, we had disappeared after Garnet Keep fell to the Marauders and hadn't looked back. We... Believe. We have word from the Celestine Tower, Your Grace. We do? Yes, trust me. May we permit Lamprey Candler to enter this meeting? Oh, the, the gentleman with the rest of your group in the parlor. Lamprey? The owner of the Toasted Frog? Oh, I thought he looked familiar. It's a wonderful establishment. Absolutely. The best mead, Your Grace. The same. Yes. If you so desire. Victor, can you fetch Mr. Candler? Right away, Your Grace. The tall and strongly built guard walked heavily to the door to exit the room. I'll be honest. I hadn't paid much attention to the conversation between Lamprey and Elaviv on the way to the keep, but apparently they were catching up on more current events than I had thought. <laughs> she was always a step ahead of me. Soon he returned with Lamprey, marching alongside him with a stride indicating purpose. Your Grace, may I introduce Lamprey Candler, sole proprietor of the Toasted Frog. Thank you, sir. I am at your service. Truly, noble one. <laughs> well met, Mr. Candler. Elaviv told us you may have word of the order currently within the Celestine Tower. Is that an accurate assumption? Yes, sir. I received word from an old compatriot and friend of mine that, uh, in recent weeks there was rumors of a lot of activity northwest of the tower. Well, when scouts were sent out, they found the activity coming from the old obsidian fortress. What? That's... that's not possible. It's been abandoned for centuries. Guarded by... By the curse. My heart sank as she looked at me. The Obsidian Fortress was a bastion supposedly cursed by the Knights of the Glen centuries ago to 
to never allow anyone in until the order was restored or required. Powerful magic would be required to negate that curse. Not to mention my understanding was the people of Wolfling were not hospitable nor receptive to anyone living in that tower, ever. If Pallas was setting up his base there, and not in Enrook as we had originally thought, that would be very concerning. Yes, the curse. Forgive my memory, not recalling specifics. Oh, allow me, Your Grace. The legend has it that when the Order was losing members, following the mutual separation of the forces from Bloodwood and Viridian, the Order decided to put in place magical wards to protect the Five Bastions. Well, the Obsidian Fortress, being so close to the Wolfling Barbarians and the Shattered Lands, it was decided to use an old dark magic to seal it, and seal it as close to permanently as possible. Oh, wait. Oh, no. What? Elias, what did they use to seal it? Blood. The blood of the original six armies from the War of the Stone. Those that formed the Alliance that made their order in the first place. He could have collected blood from Viridian and Bloodwood. He had conquered them at least partially by the time he attacked Port Lafour. And if he's been set up in Troll for as long as I've heard tell, then he's had access to the blood of the Dwarves, Elves, and men of that region as well. I would assume that could help complete this grim portfolio. My hands were cold despite the fire now. My head throbbed with a deep worry as my brow furrowed. The people within the original armies were lost to time. The legend stated it consisted of the hammer and axe armies of the dwarves, the tree and stream armies of the elves, and the stag and wolf armies of man. The, the only organized army in these times that could oppose him is the Knights of the Glen. But the Celestine Tower is the last remaining outpost of our order. Well, last that I heard. Uh, that's true, sir. The Knights slowly faded into antiquity, they did. It's, uh, it's only unsold salts that remain. <laughs> Lamprey, if the word you received is true, then the Celestine Tower would be his strategic next step. If it should fall, then the free people of the world can expect no assistance from an inevitable doom. <sighs> Your Grace, we will set out together in the morning. We will march to the Celestine Tower. Sir Keldor? Yes. Please do go with haste. I can only hope this is a false alarm, but we should plan for a storm. Godspeed, my friend. Sophie is played by Sarah Jenkins. Gottmere Flintgrog is played by Colton Jansen. Cordelia Shieldheart is played by Jolene Frescas. Mix the Chaotic, played by Daniel Nichols from the Happy Go Lucky podcast. Zorin, played by Cody Miller. Benedict Shieldheart, played by Brian Dowling. Lamprey the Bartender is played by Matthew Bianchi. The Duke of Ellington is played by Michael J. Rigg. Miloslava Mugwort is played by Caitlin Altoff. Girl is played by Saoirse Brown. Hannah Mullen. Talmanir. Abigail Richardson. Ellington Guard, played by Benjamin Corley. Ellaby Falklight is played by Jessica Ashley. Elias Silvertongue is played by Scott C. Brown of the Two Bards, One Mike podcast. And I am Mike Ashley, the voice of Kildor, your narrator. There's no surprise. We need to muster support, adventurers. Your secret word in this episode is Zorin. Z-O-R-I-N. To find out more, join our Patreon for as little as $2 a month. Thanks to our patrons, Haley Munoz, Daniel Nichols, Jolene Fresquez, Brian Dowling, 
Colin Holmes, Tony Fomar, and Corey Fouch. Stay tuned as we march together and join our fellow knights at the Celestine Tower. Until then, stay safe and remember the oath. <laughs>